Hello dear friends and colleagues and greetings from MM Seminars here in Athens, Greece. This brief presentation is part of a course we give for indirect posterior raising and composite restorations. Now every day in our clinics we're faced with a question what is the best material or the best technique for posterior restorations. Now I don't want to spoil the surprise but I do not think that indirect present composite restoration is the best we can do. Now this is maybe due to my prosthodontic background, but I think indirect cold restoration is the best our patient can have. And we've all seen cases of cold inlays and onlays or overlays that have performed extremely well in the course of time. Of course, it comes a time when the gold can be abraded on the occlusal part or we may have discrepancy in the margins and they have to be replaced but when we remove them as we see here in this case that they've served the patient for about 45 years and it's obvious on the middle part of the premolar that the disc was used so it's not such an elegant technique as we have today but after initial chiris removal we've seen all the two structure that has been preserved so my personal belief is that Partial coverage crown, especially made out of gold, is the best we can give to our patient. But unfortunately, gold is not, it's not an aesthetic material and doesn't have a high demand nowadays, so it's being replaced by ceramic and composite. But the question remains, if I change only the materials into an excellent clinical technique, like the ones I have with gold inlays and onlays, will I have the same excellent results? Because ceramics and composites have been used, for example, for veneers in the anterior segment, and they behave extremely well. So if you only change, if you substitute the gold with a ceramic or composite, and the uh, phosphate cement with a resin cement, will that guarantee that I will have the same excellent results? The technique for indirect composite restoration has been described in such a way, meaning that if you have a, a deep cavity, we can place calcium hydroxide or glass iron for the protection of the pulp, but if we do not have such a deep cavity, we can make our, our impression directly on enamel and dentin. And then the indirect restoration is being fabricated in the cast, which, and then it will be subsequently cemented in the mouth with the help of a resin cement. Now, in this publication of Dr. Douglas, who is, I'm sure, an excellent dentist, we see this excellent result, but in our daily practice, we often see cases that it's not the same thing. For example, we see this case that all the restorations were done at the same time by the same dentist and the same technician, and we see that the second molar, the cold restoration, performed extremely well, whereas in the anterior part of the mouth, uh, it doesn't seem to, the ceramic inlays do not seem to behave so nicely as we see in this close-up. Some were decemented, and in some other segments of the mound, we see even some worst uh, problems. Now, the companies make us think and put us guilt that it's our fault that we don't use the best material. And sometimes we're lost in the labyrinth trying to find which is the most ideal material. Now, I personally believe that sometimes you have to think out of the box, and it's not a question of the best material, but of the best technique. And of course, it's not me, if some other pioneers that many years ago have thought that, mm, that there's not a problem of the material, but a problem of the technique. And in order, uh, we all remember that we have to uh, keep it simple and find the best solution for it. And I think that there has been many, many techniques that have been proposed, like dual bonding, resin coating, cavity sealing, immediate dentin sealing, all of them have the same uh, thing that we must bond to enamel and to dentin separately. Meaning that the first appointment we're emphasizing on sealing the dentin and I think that it's better to emphasize in the second appointment of uh, bonding to enamel. So come to this clinical case, after caries removal and placing of the rubber dam, we often face these um, undercuts. Of course, we do not remove the tooth structure uh, in order to eliminate the undercut, but we have to fill in the undercuts. And instead of using calcium hydroxide or, or glass ionomer, we prefer 
to strengthen to adhesively reconstruct the abutment with the help of bonding agent and composite resin. So the first step is to place our bonding agent, our bonding system. For dentin, I prefer using two-step self-fetching uh, bonding system. So we see that after placement, they perfectly reflect the light and we show that they've been applied to all the surface of the dentin. And then a thin layer of flowable composite is being placed on top of it. This can be considered as the last step of our bonding procedure just to stabilize our bonding agent. Then, in order to adhesively reconstruct the abutment, we place our composite accordingly to our needs. For example, here we place a thin layer of uh, flowable composite as a first layer and then regular composite in order to fill in the undercuts and cover the flowable composite. This is what I like to call adhesive abutment reconstruction. So we've used our bonding agent and our resin composite not only to cover the dentin but also to to fill the undercuts and adhesively reconstruct our abutment. Now, of course, we could make uh, an impression to that, and this was uh, uh, with the terms cavity sealing or resin coating, but I think it makes more sense to finish our margins and remove the bonding agent or composite from the margin and have clean enamel at the margin. Because at the end, what we want is to have resin composite covering all where it used to be dentin and enamel at our borders. And we will be able to do our restoration perfectly to the enamel borders at, the, at our second appointment, but it will also adhere very well to the resin composite that has covered the dentin. Now, looking at this uh, demonstration uh, video of adhesive abutment reconstruction, we may place uh, a transparent matrix. This is good for when we make a video because it's easier to observe what's uh, going on. Most of the times I like uh, placing uh, metal matrix in the mouth. And as we have to emphasize on adhering to dentin, a two-step self-etching system will be used in this case. The wedge is being placed to stabilize our matrix and then the primer of our two-step bonding system is being applied. In this case, we used Optibond XDR from Kerr, and the microbus is being used to scrub the primer to the dentin, because I think it's been shown that we obtain better results in this way. Now, we must give time for the primer to condition uh, the dentin, so we leave it some time and then we apply a second portion. Usually the advocate, the company say less time, I prefer using about 30 seconds, and then the excess is being removed with a vacuum, and of course if you use, you can uh, use thin air. Then the adhesive, the bonding agent is being, uh, the adhesive resin is being placed also with a microbrush and is being scrubbed on the dentin because this has also shown to produce better results. And we will leave another 30 seconds for the adhesive and give it the ability to penetrate well in the conditioned uh, dentin. We see that we constantly rub the, the adhesive and then we remove the excess with the help of a vacuum. And of course we can use a, a thin air stream to make sure that it's been, we have a thin layer everywhere and then it's being cured for 30 seconds. Of course in this video uh, we've removed a little bit of time for the, for the curing procedure. Now, when we're close to the pulp, uh, or if we want to place it very, very carefully, we can use a flowable composite with the 23 or 25 uh, G uh, tips that allow us very precise placement exactly where we want to place it, and then we will cure for 20 seconds. But of course, if we want to place larger quantities of flowable composite, it's better to use a 20 shape tip which is a little bit larger as you can see as you can clearly see that has helped us put our flowable composite evenly in all the areas of our restoration in an easier manner than uh, the thinner tip. 
we must make sure we don't want to use too much excess of, uh, of uh, flowable composite, just a thin layer that we can evenly spread it with, a, with the help of a composite resin placement instrument, or sometimes it's very convenient to use one of periodontal probe, the who, uh, that has a little bit of, um, of a bone at the end. It's like a very, very small daikon instrument that can help us very easily position the flowable composite exactly where we want to. After make sure that we don't have any bubbles inside the flowable composite, we will cure the second layer for another 20 seconds. Then we use regular composite, in this case uh, sonic fill from Kerr, which is a sound activated uh, bulk filling composite have, uh, has been applied. Because as it's a slow, low strengthening material, we can place everything in one layer. And we want to make sure that we fill all the undercuts. So it's being placed and then with the help of a micro brush, we can help it very well go and fill the undermine uh, cusps. With the help of a micro brush, it's very easy to make an even layer of, uh, of the composite resin. Of course, we can use composite instruments in order to make sure that we block the undercut and at the same time we make um, our vertical wall to be a little bit uh, straighter, as you can see here. And of course, I like using, for the same reason, some uh, micro applicators that resemble the form of a diamond, so they help me uh, place the composite exactly as I want in order to make the sloped vertical wall of the cusps. So as you can see here, it's a very easy procedure to place a, a regular a composite and then it's being cured for another 20 seconds. We are more or less now finished with adhesive reconstruction of the abutment, but it's mandatory that we don't have any uncured polymer or any uncured resin on top. So that's why we use a glycerin gel in order to do our final polymerization and avoid having the oxygen on inhibition layer on the top of our uh, preparation. Now we have finished with the adhesive reconstruction of our abutment. The metrics can be removed and then but we're not done completely. Of course, we could make an impression at this point, but uh, and it has been proposed, but I think it's much better if we finish the margins and make sure that we have enamel at the borders. Now we see the abutment after cleaning and uh, removing the air gel and finishing, then we think we see that everything is covered by composite. We don't have the enamel is not clean, we have bonding agent and in some areas a little bit of composite on the margin. And this we want to avoid, we want to finish our margin in a subsequent step. So, saying that, we can use various material. When we are closer to the adjacent tooth, it's very nice to use these ultrasonic instruments that they, are, they have a diamond coating in the side of the tooth, but they're smooth to the adjacent tooth, so we can just work with them very easily and making 100% that we will avoid damaging the adjacent tooth. There are different sizes, there are larger ones for the box, but they're also ball shaped, like cut in half, that we can do fine polishing at the corners, and they're very, very nice. Now, in this video, because they have to be used with water, it's not very clear to see how they work, but after polishing, you can see how well they have polished our margin without damaging the adjacent tooth. Now, for removing uh, the excess, uh, sorry, the bonding agent from the enamel margin, you can use fine diamonds without uh, a slow speed with right hand piece uh, without water, and in that way, you make sure that you see that you have clean enamel margins. Now, experienced uh, uh, dentists, I think that with the feel of preparation, we can do it, uh, of course, with, uh, with uh, water. We don't need to do it dry, because when it's dry, we are not 100% sure that we will avoid over, overheating the pulp. So even though in this demonstration uh, video is being shown being completely dry, in most of the cases in the mouth, I prefer using with uh, water. And especially when you have larger diamonds, I think it's, it's, it's uh, mandatory that we use your water as you see here. Of course, you cannot observe very well in the video what is being done and you cannot make sure that uh, the enamel is being removed. But 
you have the feeling of the margin and you just follow the margin you don't need to prepare any special geometry we just want to clean the margin and make a let's say five or ten maximum degrees angle make sure that we remove all the unsupported enamel and everything is clean of course we can use if we think that we have some small edges we can use again the ultrasonic instrument and perfectly clean the margin at the proximal box where we have enamel margins and we can see it's very clear that all margin is uh, clean. Now, maybe this is due again to the prosthodontic background, but I, I personally prefer using uh, the larger available timer that can do my work. And I like using round-ended round -ended fine diamonds for this procedure. This is my uh, top option. And you must make sure that we don't have any remnants of the bonding of composite outside of the periphery of the margin and that's why we can use disc or as we'll see uh, sometimes disc in the, in the proximal areas but it's nice to use also coarse uh, instruments to finish our margins uh, coarse uh, rubber as we can see here silicon rubbers and we want to make sure as we pass the margins also this have to be uh, it's better to uh, use them with water so that we avoid overheating the margin and this is the last step of polishing the margin and we can see now that the margins are not also clean but after with the rubber point we can see that they're shining so uh, they're smooth and nice and we're ready to make our impression now the question is why should you use this technique is it because I say so and you have to understand that when this whole thing was introduced we didn't have all the scientific data to back are uh, things. Now, many, many years in the past, my ancestor built the Parthenon, and of course, they didn't have uh, scientific journals and uh, evidence based uh, uh, civil engineering and so forth, but they did rather well. And I think they did well because they used the common sense. And whatever faults they have seen in the past, they tried to uh, correct them and find the best solution for it. Now, in order to see why should we do that, I think the question is very simple. If we see enamel and dentin, these two materials are completely different. Enamel has a very low water content below 3%, whereas dentin is filled with uh, water. Now, if we use the traditional uh, technique and we want to adhere our indirect restoration with resin cement, then our resin cement has to glue, let's say, at one time in all three substances. Now, regardless with a different name, if you call it dentin sealing or resin coating or what other words were used, the secret of success is to cover our dentin with a bonding system. Now again, our entire restoration is being glued with a resin cement. And of course, it's easier because it does have to adhere to dentin, but it will adhere to the bonding system. The proposed technique that uh, we mentioned in this video, the adhesive abutment reconstruction, as you see, the bonding agent will be covered then on top with a resin composite. We propose using indirect resin composite restoration, and as you've seen in previous presentation, we don't use a resin cement, but a resin composite, a like your composite. Now, if we compare the right and the left hand side of these slides, it's, I think it's quite easy to understand that on the right, on the left hand side, our resin cement has to perform very well at the same time with three different interfaces with enamel and dentin and the indirect restoration. On the other hand, if we use a resin composite indirect restoration that is glued with resin composite to add an abutment that it's been adhesively reconstructed and we only have resin composite and enamel. We only have one interface to take care of in our second appointment, the looting appointment, and this is just composite to enamel that will be etched, which is clean enamel, and we know that this behaves very well. So I think this is the key to our solution, and I strongly encourage you to uh, try this technique because it gives excellent clinical results. I'm looking forward to your comments. Uh, and hopefully I will be able to answer if you have uh, any. Thank you very much for your attention.